So as the majority of you know, at least current fellows, I did a dual project for my fellowship with the um, Center for Private Equity and Venture Capital. So this project touches on um, how firms, especially large corporations, should think about launching a corporate venture arm in order to spark innovation. Um, so we'll dive in. Um, really, you know, at this point in time, corporate venture is super, super sexy. You know, everyone, every firm wants to get into it. You see car companies getting into it, banking getting into it, old P&G companies getting into it, like CPG companies. So I really came up with this thesis that you can't go at it haphazardly in order to chase innovation. Um, it has to be done properly with a structured strategy. Um, notably, it has to exist for a reason. There has to be some thesis in your domain as to why you're setting this up. Uh, the structure and the metrics by which you judge and measure performance, both on your investments and in your talent, have to directly match with the thesis and the goals. And a lot of um, CEOs, especially in big corporations, are so driven by quarterly profits or annual 10Ks Venture is an eight to 10 year cycle. Um, so you can't just get rid of your venture arm on a down cycle. So those are sort of the three big buckets that I'll touch on. Um, they reinforce each other in a virtuous cycle. So the thesis and goals drive the structure and metrics, which drive the long-term commitment, all directed for innovation. For those of you who don't know much about corporate venture and what's going on, um, here's a brief background. It's really, really happening right now. I mean, it is, it's the thing. Um, venture deals with corporate factors are much more expensive, like 20% more expensive. Um, they're in, at this point, they're probably in about 25% of deals in 2019 thus far. And everyone, like I said, every industry is touching on it. Um, but notably, the biggest industries in it and the biggest players are all big tech companies. And so CPG companies, industrials are trying to catch up. My thesis is that they won't, um, but we'll get into that as well. So notably, we'll start with the thesis and the goals. Um, there are four distinct categories that we find in venture. Uh, financial, that's, that's your typical venture guy or female, woman, venture person. Strategic internal, this would be you find some company, some startup that will help you build upon your current product, your current offering. Number three, the ecosystem. How do you develop your ecosystem as a whole? Does that mean you find a customer or build out someone you can sell through and then outsource? Um, that's more traditional as well. So we'll focus on these two. This is where corporate venture should be in the strategic realm. They're not equipped to do financial and a lot of them do move towards outsource, but it should again be strategic. So um, investment categories. What it comes down to is the strategic investment is a balance of the maturity of the industry and the risk tolerance. Um, it requires risk. Fundamentally, venture requires risk. If you're doing it to just sort of maintain your position as a core industry, as a core um, legacy, or even if you're emerging and you just want to keep pace, venture is probably not the right place to do this. Um, you do it because you're willing to take a risk, you have some capital, and you're either really being challenged and you need what I call a moonshot, or you're in an emerging industry and you need to leapfrog competitors who might be doing this in-house. Um, again, the objective that we talked about, these strategic objectives, have to align with your talent. Um, venture investors tend to like money. And a lot of times the salary system in a corporation does not provide the incentive for really good investors to stay. Um, so what you find is that a lot of companies will start in this sort of financial business unit support safe bet role. That's where you're assured you're not gonna lose any money and you have a business unit signing off on your investment. So you can invest without a product team, a management team saying this investment makes sense, it's a safe bet. As the venture arm matures and cycles, they tend to move into the complementary role where the investor gets a little bit more freedom. They still need business unit support, but financially there might be a little more capital to play with. 
CEO is a little more, um, you know, involved in it and allows freedom for the investor, and then move down into the innovator, where the investors, as they mature, want a lot more freedom and they want to be more strategic. Finances, the financial aspect, kind of goes out the door, and then of course traditional VC is in the return category. Um, moving into structure and metrics, we've touched on talent, but again, different investment strategies require different talent. And a lot of firms get this really, really wrong. Um, and again, the metrics differ too. You can't just use traditional IRR and cash on cash. Um, for your safe bets and complementers, it's a pretty safe bet to use internal talent. Most of these will require that you do partner with an internal arm, so being able to navigate those relationships along with knowing your business, knowing your product, knowing your market, that all that knowledge comes with an internal hire. Um, external hires are better for returners and innovators because those are more strategic, um, longer cycles, and a little bit more out of the box, and you don't have to navigate the internal politics. However, your safe bets and complimenters, they can be compensated with a salary, traditional with a corporation, Returners and innovators will want your carry, traditional carry structure to get paid on their risky bets. So just a few case studies demonstrating each of them. Intel Capital um, is pretty rare in the industry. What they do is they will cycle talent through. They refuse to flex in terms of allowing their investors the carry structure. They just cycle, cycle through. They get good people in the building and then when these people become more mature, they cycle out to traditional venture firms in order <coughs> in search of more freedom to invest and more compensation. Um, Sapphire Ventures is what SAP did. They decided instead of letting their talent cycle out the door, they would set up their own independent venture firm that SAP doesn't control, they just, they're just an LP, and so it maintains the talent, maintains the focus on the ecosystem, but it gives the investors more freedom. This is pretty typical. This is what most, most of the firms we're seeing today are doing because they're scared of losing their investor talent. Um, Xerox got it wrong. They started a firm and they were somewhere in the middle. They allowed their investors, the traditional carry, to monetize and commercialize park research. However, the internal bodies, the other internal teams, were fighting for the same resources. And eventually they had to shut it down because the internal hires and other managers were seeing this high, high, high compensation based on research they had done. And so they internalized it and it went under and got um, taken over completely. AT&T, another one. Um, the managers here, you know, they were looking at, they invested heavily in Juniper Networks, but AT&T's networks would not employ it deploy it because they are measured on EBITDA. And the thing with venture is you don't get EBITDA immediately. It's long-term balance sheet appreciation. Now when managers are measured on EBITDA, they have no incentive to deploy new technologies where you get warrants instead of a cash discount. So they stayed with Cisco. So like I noted, um, you tend to see people in firms moving into the outside alignment quadrant where firms opt to maintain their talent, become LPs, and give them a brand new name. Norwest was Wells Fargo's. Um, you see Lilly, they completely moved up there. They maintain the name Lilly Ventures, but they don't control from the corporate side. GE is likely gonna do the same thing as well. There's a lot going on there, but they're just about to let them become a fully independent body in order to keep the investor talent. Um, but if you get it wrong, you know, if you have carry compensation and a focus investment scope, that doesn't make any sense. If you have a salary and a broad investment scope, that also doesn't make sense. So success, again, um, it's really, really hard to measure. How do you measure long-term strategy if you're a big corporation based on tiny little startups you might be funding? Um, again, financial measurement doesn't make sense. You really have to think about quantitative and qualitative, and they have to match, the met like your metrics have to match your incentives for your investors. So just a few kind of brainstorming ideas and a framework for managers to think about when they set this up. Um, 
because it's really, really hard. This is probably the hardest part to get right um, because it's so different and so divergent and venture is such a wild west. Um, so last, we'll talk about leadership commitment in the long term. Um, it really comes from the CEO. It has to come top down in order to instill a culture of entrepreneurship and make sure that the CEO does a good job maintaining the vision of this, that even when they're gone, the venture firm will continue. Um, this is, I think, one of the most interesting things I thought of is a lot of corporate venture firms don't think like this. They don't think that they'll be as, around as long as the firms they invest in. That's just something you have to do. Um, and a lot of times during down cycles, they will divest their venture firm because it's easy to get cash out. And a lot of times it's fun money for corporate, not necessarily strategic. Um, again, CEO is important. Educating the entire corporation at a whole is super important so you don't fight for resources internally. Um, you can't measure these things quarterly. Uh, you can do cer like certain types of churn measurements and things like that, but typical measurements of a corporation will not work. And again, economic cycles are another big one. So really to get this thing right, you have to have a strategy and a structure and a reason to do it. Um, it seems like a cool thing to do, but if you get it wrong, you're wasting capital when you could probably be deploying it elsewhere. Thank you. Questions? It seems like a lot of corporate ventures invest in companies as like a protectionist strategy to buy the thing that might make them, or invest in the thing that might make them relevant in the future. <coughs> okay. Do you yeah. feel like corporate ventures should be investing in companies that don't have really anything to do with their business in some capacity, like, or should it always be in some way tied to the core of their business just to ensure that they're taking a diverse view of companies? The most successful venture firms focus in their ecosystem. They focus somewhere where it is um, relevant to them in some capacity. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense for you know, a company in a legacy industry to invest in something totally different. They don't have the knowledge, they don't have the foresight, especially when they're using internal hires who don't know anything about it. Um, it comes down to the talent again. Um, so two things. One, one of the reasons why Intel cycles through their talent is because part of their strategy is many of their investment relies on the internal resources of Intel, whether it's distribution, whether it's technology, and so to get those people who are willing to work with the ventures, they couldn't have this outside, this outsized compensation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I was surprised a little bit that you didn't talk about in making the decisions about how reliant the success of the ventures are on the parent being involved in allocating resources. Um, and, and the second thing, there's been a lot of criticism around this that, that venture, um, reduces the urgency because they're more patient capital, reduces the urgency of some of the ventures and that impacts their long-term success because they aren't as hard charging. And so you just kind of comment on those two things. Yeah, so I think um, in terms of Intel and the need for those internal resources, I mm -hmm. think you, know, you can really see it both ways, for sure. I mean, a, a lot of times Intel really does play the game where we're gonna use our networks. Um, I talked to Samsung as well, and they do some really interesting things. A lot of these firms will set up multiple venture arms. Some of them <coughs> do require internal sign off some of them don't, just so that they cover all their bases. Um, you also find some of the most successful ones, like SAP and Sapphire, they don't necessarily use SAP's distribution networks, um, and they're still wildly successful in setting up this broader ecosystem. So it comes down again to my, my personal thesis is that it's all about the talent. If you really want to maintain good talent and look for the long-term goals, not necessarily quick wins, I think Intel, when they look at you know their current distribution networks, what they can currently add in terms of value, those are two to three year bets because you're thinking current. Um, long-term, in order to leapfrog or look for something different, you have to get out of the corporation because 
that constrains you to thinking about what exists today and sort of what an investor might see as existing eight to 10 years from now. Um, other question. Just the long term, long term value, like that are, mm -hmm. has, has the, I mean, the corporate venture had, has had a really bad sort of reputation in terms of its investment success. Has that gotten better or? I think that's, well that's the problem, right, is that um, it's hard to measure. Like metrics are just hard to measure and you can't go in thinking, okay, we're just not gonna lose money. That's not a reasonable way to measure it. And I think since corporate ventures are, you, can, you know, you do get some like cash on cash IRR types of measurements, but they're not gonna look like the broader market a lot of the time. Um, but again, how do you measure like, the, the, these are some of the things that you would be able to measure, and a lot of companies don't do this. I mean, it takes a lot of work to do this, and they don't know what they're doing most of the time. Um, I do think um, you do see some of them being really successful. Like before Xerox shut theirs down, they were like a 56% return or something crazy like that. So if you have a really narrow scope and you're focused on something that makes sense for you, um, I think it's a good idea. But I do understand the, the problem is everyone is doing it and they're doing it poorly. But you don't see many people critiquing Intel or M12 or Google Ventures because they're doing it really well. Um, it's just a really crowded market and it's a really wrong market. And so people are making bad investments. I think it's you know capital, fun money that they have that they're trying to deploy and they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. You suggested that uh, many of the successful models have shifted towards one where there's a lot of independence from the main corporate entity. Yeah. Um, if that's the case, do you, do you envision uh, maybe a slightly different model where corporations, instead of having their own corporate venture arms, rather have an industry-wide venture arm where multiple corporations are, are potentially LPs within it to kind of achieve the same objective? It, mm -hmm. it, I'm struggling to see why SAP benefits from Sapphire Ventures when instead but like why that connection needs to be there directly as opposed to a broader industry focused venture arm. Do you mean like why, uh, I want to make sure I understand your question, why SAP didn't keep it internal, why they? No, no, rather uh, why SAP needs to have Sapphire Ventures as opposed to SAP just investing money broadly into industry focused uh, independent venture mm -hmm. firms that still kind of build the ecosystem that SAP wants. I think, um, Again, talent, I hate to keep coming back to that, but they found really good investors and it's hard to find good investors because of the networking needed. Um, so they had a bunch of investors that had these networks that knew people in the Valley that they would get first shot at these deals. Um, you do see some, um, like Norwest, was, Wells Fargo is there, the sole LP, Bloomberg just set up their own, completely independent, um, they're a sole LP. But you do see some emerging where they are syndications. Um, and a lot of Google Ventures are syndications. It's, it's rare to find an internal inside one where they are um, the sole LP. Yeah. Um, for these tech-based CDCs, how do they balance the long-term investment cycles with like a culture failing fast? It doesn't seem like that's something that could work inside a CDC, but I also struggle to see how you would build a CDC and then totally cut the culture from your main campus. Yeah, they keep, they keep them relatively, I think the fail fast, um, that is a lot of venture. You see, I mean, you make, you're making a ton of bets, you're seeing a lot, all the time, and a lot of these companies, you know, you, they might fail within two, three years. It's the long-term ones that really give you your return. Um, you know, I think the ven venture people are inherently risk-seeking, which I think works within a fail-fast uh, community. And I think um, a lot of them, especially on this inside, you see, you get results relatively, like, quickly. Um, because you do, like Patrick noted, you have the distribution network, you're relying on what's currently within the structure. But again, getting the culture fit right with your venture people to make sure that they're fully aligned with the product units is a really big struggle for a lot of them, um, unless they're established and have support from the top. Chris, do you have one? That was my that was it. Perfect. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah.